1980, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it is no longer constitutional to post the Ten Commandments on the classroom wall. And then, just a short time ago, we watched the unfolding saga of Judge Roy Moore, Chief Justice of the State of Alabama Supreme Court. Moore against the United States government. And the issue was a monument of the Ten Commandments in the Alabama courthouse. And once again, the Ten Commandments lost. And I can still see those U.S. Marshals rolling out that big stone monument of the law of God. And it kind of gives us a window, an insight, into the major battle outlined in the book of Revelation for the end times. As we've learned, the real issue is the challenge of God's authority as the creator of the heavens and the earth. Satan, that dragon, wants to establish himself on God's throne, but he knew that before he could ever secure the allegiance of any man or woman on this earth, he had to somehow undermine the authority of God as the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we saw how the theory of evolution has made inroads into almost every fabric of society today, undermining God's authority. But long before that, Satan knew that there was another major obstacle in the way before he could ever pave the way for undermining God's authority with the theory of evolution. He knew that God had established a monument, a memorial, a reminder carved through the channels of time, the Sabbath day pointing to God as the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he knew that as long as men and women remembered the Sabbath day, they would never, never give their allegiance to the beast instead of the creator. And so as we learn, he began to attack the very law of God because Daniel 7 verse 25 says, In the last days that little horn, who is the beast of the Antichrist, would try to change God's set times and laws. And we saw a dramatic unfolding of that prophecy when the little horn, the medieval church of Rome, officially decreed the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day to the first, attacking the times, set times, and the laws of God. And I hope you're beginning to see how all of this fits into the picture of Revelation. Because it was just a preview of the prophecy in Revelation chapter 12. When the dragon saw he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And in verse 17, the dragon was angry at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And at the end of this section describing that war, he says in chapter 14, verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. So the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ are like bookends on both sides of this chapter unfolding the war between the dragon and the people of God. The object of the Antichrist attack is the law of God and the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It saddened me to know that our country would oppose the Ten Commandments of God. But it saddens me even more when I see the war against the Ten Commandments sounding from Christian pulpits. Now you say, I've never heard it from a Christian pulpit. You have. 
Haven't you heard that the Ten Commandments were for the Jews and in the New Testament we don't have the Ten Commandments, we have love? Haven't you heard that the law was Old Testament, New Testament is done away with? Haven't you heard that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ? And since we're under grace and no longer under the law, then we're no longer obligated to obey the law? Billy Graham heard it. In his article, this was from the uh, Dallas Times and Herald newspaper, 14 July 1995, question to Billy Graham. Some religious people I know tell me that the Ten Commandments are part of the law and do not apply to us today. They say we as Christians are free from the law. Is that right? Answer, Billy Graham. No, it is not right and I hope you'll not be misled by these false opinions. Billy Graham heard it that the law has been done away with and he called it a false opinion. But didn't Jesus say that I give you a new command that you love one another and that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul? Well, John says in the little book of 2 John, only one chapter, so 2 John verse 5, he says, Now I am not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. Now, Jesus said, I give you a new command, that we love one another. John says, I'm not writing you a new command, but one that we've had from the beginning. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. This is new. John says it's not new. So who's right, Jesus or John? They're both right. You say, how can they both be right? Jesus said it's new. John said it wasn't new. The truth is it wasn't new. When Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul, he was quoting the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. It wasn't new. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he was quoting the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It wasn't new. So why did he say, I give you a new command, love one another? Because it was new to them. You see, they had lost sight of the fact that God's commandments are laws of love. It's easy to overlook this if you don't know Greek. Because in Greek, there are two different words for new. Neos, new. Kainos, new. Neos, brand new. Kainos, new to the person. Now... About a year ago, our car broke, and I had to go buy a new car. Now, when we buy a new car, we don't go into the dealer's showroom and look at all these brand new shiny vehicles with two miles on the odometer. We go next door to the pre-owned car lot. They don't sell used cars anymore, you know that? They're pre-owned cars. <laughs> so we go to the pre-owned car lot and pick out a new car. Kynos, because it's new for me. And when we drove that new little Toyota RAV4 home, my neighbor saw me just turning into the road and he says, oh, Jack, you got a new car. Yeah, man, I got a new car. Kynos. New car. But it wasn't Naos, brand new, because it was pre-owned. And so Jesus said, I give you a new command, Kynos. John says, I'm not writing you something new, Naos that you love one another. So you see, it was new to them. They had lost sight of the fact that God's law 
is a law of love. In fact, John goes on to say, I'm not writing you a new command, naos new, but one that we've had from the beginning. It's kainos new. I ask you that we love one another. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. What is love? Love is obedience to the commandments of God. In other words, in mathematical formulas, love equals obedience to the commandments of God. But in the very same letter, 1 John 4, 16, the Bible says, God is love. God is love. Love is obeying the commandments. Now, I learned in algebra, I think it was, a long time ago, that two things that are equal to a third thing have to be equal to each other. Isn't that right? If you don't understand that, it's right. <laughs> Check your books. Two things that are equal to a third thing have to be equal to each other. Now, if God is love, and love is obeying the commandments of God, and two things equal to a third thing have to be equal to each other, God is love, obeying the commandments of God is love, then obeying the commandments is some kind of a description of what God is like. And since he made us in his image, it describes what love is like for us. You see, we learn that God functions with laws. When he created the universe, he had physical laws, the law of centrifugal force, the law of gravity, the law of centripetal force, all these physical laws that hold the universe together. And if one of those laws fail, then the whole thing comes crashing down. But when he made the man and the woman, he made them according to certain laws. And he says, this is the way I made you. And he defined those principles, those laws of love. It was like a circle. And he said, if you stay inside the circle, you're going to have peace and joy and happiness. But if you step outside of the circle, you're going to break. And you're going to suffer. And a lot of other people are going to get hurt too. That's the purpose for God's laws, not because he's a meanie that doesn't want us to have fun, but he knows that if we step outside of the circle, we're going to get hurt. And he loves us, and he wants us to enjoy love and peace and happiness. His law defines love for us. Paul made that clear in Romans, the 13th chapter. Romans chapter 13 says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Now, if we were to stop here, we could say, well, you don't have to obey the law. You just need to love one another. But Paul didn't stop there, so we shouldn't either. He goes on to say, he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Well, how come? Because, verse 9, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment they may be are all summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So Paul is saying that if we love one another, we're fulfilling the law. He's not saying you don't have to do the law. He's saying the commandments, thou shalt not murder, covet, steal. These are the Ten Commandments. And they're all summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? We need to do a little math again. You're going to have to know some math to understand the Bible. What does summed up mean? It means added together. So if you take the commandment that says, thou shalt not lie, and add to it, thou shalt not steal, and add to it, thou shalt not kill, and add to it, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and add to it, honor thy father and mother, and add to it any other commandment there may be, it equals love. Well, what happens if you take one away? then you don't have love anymore. Does a man really love his neighbor if he's having an affair with his neighbor's wife? Does he love his neighbor? If he says, hallelujah, neighbor, oh, praise the Lord, I love you so much, while he's slipping his wallet from his pocket. Is that love? See, love 
is defined by the law of God. And if you take away one, it doesn't equal love anymore. James made that crystal clear in the little book of James, the second chapter. James chapter 2, verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it because he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So according to James, love only happens when we obey all of God's commandments. And if we just break one, it's the same as breaking them all. Why? Because the commandments are like a circle that define what love and peace and joy and happiness is for us. And if we just step outside of the circle by breaking one, we don't have love anymore. We suffer and other people get hurt. You see, God isn't out there just trying to prevent us from enjoying life. He's out there trying to help us to enjoy life to the fullest with love. And if we just break one, we're guilty of breaking them all. And then he makes an, a fascinating statement to the church. James said in verse 12, Speak and act then as those who are going to be judged by the law. That gives freedom. Interesting, he refers to the Ten Commandments as the law that gives freedom because, folks, you are only free to the degree that you bring your life in harmony with the law of God. If a person steals, is he free? If one commits adultery, are they free? If one murders, are they free? Your freedom only comes to the degree that we are in harmony with the way God made us to live. And if we break one, we're guilty of breaking them all. But look at this other piece. It says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law. So James sees the time when God's Christian believers are going to be judged, and the standard of that judgment is the law of God. Now, why is that? Because God as we learn, is going to make this world over again. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to make it all over. And he's going to let us into the city. And we're going to live there. But only those who trust him enough to live within the inside of the circle. Because God is not going to let this mess happen all over again. That's why he's selective as to who can go in. So does God still want us to order our lives according to the law? Ask Jesus. Can you trust him? Jesus, is this true? Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus, everybody's trying to say that we're under grace now, we're not under law because you abolished it when you died on the cross. Is that true? And Jesus said, verse 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Is that hard to understand? Do not think I've come to abolish the law. He says, I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So don't even think I've come to abolish it. We ought to be able to stop right here and be done. Don't even think it. If somebody says to you, you're not under law anymore, you don't have to obey the Ten Commandments, don't even think that. Why not? Because Jesus said, don't think that. He said, I haven't come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill them. What does it mean he came to fulfill them? Because we learn that God expects us to be perfectly obedient to law. Break one, you break them all. He wants us to be perfectly obedient. But he also knows that we can't do it because we've all already broken the law. We've all sinned, and even if we tried, even our good deeds are like filthy rags compared to God. He knows we can't do it. 
So Jesus came and he kept the law for us. He fulfilled it perfectly. He never sinned, not one moment. And he became sin for us. He took our sin and gives us his righteousness through the cross of Jesus Christ. He gives us his perfect obedience to the law. No, he didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. So he could give it to you. So when God says, why should I let you into that city? You say, because of the perfect obedience that Jesus gave to me. And God says, good enough. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. Verse 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The heavens are still here. The earth is still here. Not one dot of an I, not one cross of a T is going to change from the law of God until everything is accomplished. And anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. I was having a discussion with one of my friends, and he said, you're wrong, Jack. God doesn't expect us to keep the Sabbath anymore. And I said, oh, why not? He says, because we're under grace. We're not under the law. I said, oh, okay. Well, if I'm under grace and that lets me break the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath, then I should also be able to come steal your car tonight while you're sleeping. He says, no, you can't do that. I said, why not? You said the Ten Commandments are done away with. And we're under grace now, so why can't I steal your car? Well, in the New Testament, he, he did away with the Ten Commandments on the cross, but he brought back nine. Did Jesus do away with ten and bring back nine in order to get rid of one? Something doesn't square up here. Don't think I've come to abolish the law. Not one dot of an I, not one cross of a T, not one holy day that I've blessed is going to change as long as the heavens and the earth are still here. Verse 21, he explains it. He says, you've heard it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Was Jesus doing away with the commandment? Thou shalt not murder? Was he saying in the Old Testament, it was a sin to murder. But now in the New Testament, those laws have been done away with. It's okay to murder, just don't get angry at him first. <laughs> Is that what he was saying? What was he saying? He was saying, you think that you've obeyed the law because you've never murdered anybody. But I'm telling you, have you ever gotten angry at your brother? then you're guilty of murder. Was he doing away with the law? No. He was lifting up the law, wasn't he? He was showing that the spirit of the law is much higher even than the letter of the law. Keeping the letter of the law isn't enough. God wants the spirit of the law in us. It's not enough not to murder. Don't get angry. Whoa, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, he makes it even clearer. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, was Jesus saying in the Old Testament it was a sin to commit adultery? But I'm telling you now in the New Testament, since we're not under the law anymore, we're under grace. You can go ahead and sleep with another man's wife or another woman outside of marriage. Just... Don't look lustfully at her. <laughs> Is that what he was saying? No. He was taking that same law from the Old Testament, Ten Commandments, and saying, you think you have obeyed the law of God because you've never slept with your neighbor's wife? I'm telling you, have you ever looked at a Playboy magazine? 
then you're guilty of committing adultery. He wasn't doing away with the law. He was lifting it up. He was making it so high that no one could ever say, God, you have to save me now because I kept the law. The spirit of the law is so much higher than the letter of the law. Jesus was doing away with the letter of the law and amplifying it, making it bigger and bigger and higher and higher so that the only way you and I can ever be saved is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He wasn't doing away with the law. Don't let anyone tell you, oh, the law has been done away with nailed to the cross. Don't even think that, Jesus said. But didn't Paul say, didn't Paul say that we're not under the law, we're under grace? Didn't Paul say that the law has been nailed to the cross, done away with? Didn't he say all these things? Paul did write some difficult texts, hard to understand. And even Peter said that. Did you know that? Peter said, our brother Paul has written to you about salvation in letters that are hard to understand. Now, if Peter had a hard time understanding it, we shouldn't be surprised if we have a difficult time with some of the things Paul wrote. And furthermore, Peter said that these men twist and distort the writings of Paul to their own destruction. And he called them lawless men. Interesting. Lawless men. That means they try to teach the law has been done away with by twisting Paul's writings to their own destruction. It doesn't have nothing to do with them. And I think we should follow that. If anybody tries to tell you the law has been done away with, you can know that's a false prophet. Because Jesus said otherwise. Now, how do we understand some of those things that Paul wrote? I'm going to show you three texts that I call difficult texts. And those three texts will give us a key to unlocking all of the other difficult writings that Paul wrote. I'm going to start with the easiest one, Romans chapter 3, verse 28. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from from observing the law. So how are we saved? We're saved by faith, not by observing the law, but by faith apart from observing the law. Now, if that was the end of the letter, we could say, well, you see, Paul's saying that since we're saved by faith, we don't have to observe the law. Maybe we could make a case for that. But it isn't the end of the letter. Because just in two more verses down, in verse 31, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So look at what Paul's saying. We're saved by faith apart from observing the law, but this faith apart from observing the law does not nullify the law at all. No, it upholds the law. So what's the key? The key is this. You may not understand how Paul got from verse 28 to verse 31. You may not be able to trace step by step all of his logic. But even if we can't trace step by step all of his logic, we still have to agree with his conclusion. Are you with me? We say by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, apart from works of the law, does that do away with the law? No, it doesn't do away with the law. It upholds the law. So we have to accept Paul's conclusion that grace does not abolish the law. No, it upholds the law. That's the key. So if anyone says that Paul wrote that since we're under grace, we don't have to keep the law, they're twisting the writings of Paul. They're coming out with a different conclusion than what Paul came out. Because Paul said grace doesn't abolish the law. In fact, it upholds the law. Are you following me? I know this is a little heavier, so nod your head, raise your hand, say amen or something. I need to see you with me now. Okay. Well, let, me, let me help you understand this a little bit. Oh, years ago, we were in... Uh, 
Mobile, Alabama. We're doing a Revelation Now meeting, and the day came for opening. So early in the morning, we loaded everything we could in a little red Ford F-150 pickup truck, drove down to the auditorium where we're going to be having the Revelation Now meetings. And uh, we did a lot of work, got all set up, you know, and then around noon, we were kind of tired. So we drove back home. We were staying in an RV park way out on the outskirts of Mobile. So my wife and I and our two boys got in the pickup, drove home, and we were kind of anxious to get home and get something to eat, get a little rest, because we needed to have opening night at Revelation Now that night. So I'm driving along, wide open highway to that little RV park, minding my own business when this man dressed in a little blue suit, white helmet, radar gun in his hand, steps out from behind a bunch of bushes, points at me, and goes like that. That means pull over down in Alabama. So I'm pulled over on the side of the road. Oh, man, I'm feeling sick. You ever have that happen to you? Not a good feeling. So he comes walking over there. I think they teach him how to walk in police school. <laughs> He's walking over there, and he has a radar gun in his hand. And I roll down my window, and he said, you were doing 55 miles an hour. See that? Yes, sir. You got to be polite. Speed limit is 45. Did you know that? No, sir. It is. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, man. 45? 55? I mean, he had me, right? The law said 45. I was doing 55. I broke the law. I was guilty. I am condemned by the law. I am under the law, condemned. And he whoosh, whipped out that little ticket book from his pocket. I think they teach him how to do that, too. He asked me for my driver's license and stuck it in there. And, oh, man, I'm under the law. I do not feel good. It does not feel good to be under the law. And he's starting to write on that pad. And he looked at my license and he said, Tennessee. Yes, sir. You live there? Yes, sir. Well, how long are you down here for? Four or five weeks. Military? No, sir. Vacation? No, sir. What are you doing here for four or five weeks? <laughs> I'm a preacher. Preacher, huh? Oh, he's writing. Oh, I'm under the law. Oh, man. <laughs> he looked at my license again. It had a little picture on it. He looked up at me, looked at the picture, looked at me. And he said, I know who you are. Aren't you that guy doing that thing about revelation over there in the auditorium? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Boy, he had me. I'm under the law. Said 45. I did 55. He tore up my ticket. Gave me my license back. And he said, keep up the good work, preacher. But slow down. <laughs> and now I am not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. Because out of the goodness of his heart, not because of anything I did, but out of the goodness of his heart, he tore up the ticket and set me free, and I do not have to pay the fine or the penalty. I am not under the law. I'm under grace, and it feels good to be under grace. Amen. It felt so good that we went home and rested and ate and got dressed, went back down for the 
the opening night of Revelation now, and I drove past that same clump of bushes. But I'm not even scared about it because I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. So I put my foot down, and I went as fast as I could go past those bushes. I'm under grace. <laughs> Do you believe that? The law said what? 45. I did 35. <laughs> Why? Because I'm under grace. I deserved to pay the fine, and out of the goodness of his art, he tore up the ticket, and I'm not about to let him down. You have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You deserve to die. You deserve to pay the fine. You deserve the penalty. But Jesus Christ, by His grace, tore up the ticket. And you're not under the law anymore. You're under grace. But does it set you free to break the law? <laughs> not a chance. It upholds the law. I'm not going to go around lying and stealing and killing and cheating because he, out of the goodness of his heart, set me free, and I'm not going to let him down. What a God. Amen? Amen? Don't let anybody tell you that the law was done away with. If the law was done away with when Jesus died on the cross, then Jesus would have had to die on the cross to prove that Satan was right when he said the law is no good. Think about that. No, the law is so perfect because it's a written description of what God is like that it can't be broken. Only way to save us is for one equal to the law to die for us in his place. And that's the Lamb of Revelation, the Lamb of God. Okay, that was an easy one. Now we need to go to the harder one. Are you ready? You awake now? I know several of you were wondering about this. Some even asked in the little book of Colossians, chapter 2. Colossians 2, verse 13. And in the middle of the verse, I want to get a little cushion there, a little context. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. You say, well, what are you going to do with that, Pastor? I'm going to believe it, for starters. <laughs> it's in the Word of God. It has to be true. You say, but that contradicts what we've just been learning. No, it doesn't. Because this letter isn't over yet. He's not finished. He has more to say. But it sounds like it. He canceled that written code with his regulations that was against us, stood opposed. Underline that. This regulation, this code that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Verse 16, though, he goes on. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or religious festival or a new moon celebration or Sabbath days. Oh, wow, it's even worse, Pastor. The law is nailed to the cross. So don't let anyone judge you by Sabbath days. How are you going to get out of that one? Well, I'm not interested in getting out of anything. I'm only interested in knowing what is God saying to me. What is he saying? Now, this is a difficult one. This is one of those verses that Paul wrote that I think Peter might have been referring to. But if we step back and look at it in its big picture, then it becomes crystal clear. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. That reminds me of Genesis, the Creator, and Exodus chapter 4, remember the Sabbath, because in six days God created all things. So how can he start this letter with a huge reminder 
of the Creator God and then come and nail to the cross the one commandment that reminds us that He is the Creator. That doesn't make sense. So what's He saying here? Let's go back. Verse 16, Therefore, let no one judge you by Sabbath days. And if you're reading in the King James, you'll notice that was even in the middle of a sentence. That's where people usually stop. But there's more. It goes on to say Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, the reality being Christ. So let no one judge you by Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. What does that mean? For a moment, I want you to just forget about shadows. We'll describe and we'll understand what the shadow means. So don't worry about what it means. It's just there. And uh, let me illustrate it this way. Let no one judge you by Sabbath days. Which ones? The ones which are shadows. What's a shadow? Doesn't matter for now. Don't, don't worry about that. Let no one judge you by Sabbath days, which are shadows. Now follow me. Let's see. Imagine that this plant, oh yeah, here, look. Here's some grapes. Can you see the grapes? There's some purple ones, some red ones, and some green ones. Now these aren't mine, so I can't do this, but uh, let's just pretend I could say, is anybody here hungry tonight? I'm going to let you have all the grapes which are green. Now, am I talking about the purple ones? No. Am I talking about the red ones? Which one am I talking about? The green ones. So when Paul says, let no man judge you by Sabbath days, which are shadows, is he talking about Sabbath days which are not shadows? See? Now, what is a shadow? Well, in order to answer that, we're going to have to go down to the Old Testament, Leviticus 23. And here's where it really gets deep. So shake the cobwebs out. You can get this. It is exciting. And you're going to understand things about the Bible now that a lot of people never get. Look, chapter 23, verse 3. There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. You're not to do any work. Wherever you live, it's a Sabbath to the Lord. So you can work for six days rest. That's the fourth commandment, isn't it? We've already learned about that. That Sabbath day is a reminder, it's a monument, we learn, pointing us back to creation. It points us back to that great creative act of God. And it reminds us of His authority as the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's the seventh day Sabbath. Now, just to condense things a little bit, make it a little easier for us, is it okay if I call that one the weekly Sabbath? Okay, because it comes how often? Once a week. Very good. Now... You knew that already. But look at chapter 23, this time verse 26. The Lord said to Moses, The tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. When is the day of atonement? The tenth day of the seventh month. What is the day of atonement? Verse 32, it is a Sabbath of rest for you. So here's a Sabbath day that comes on, the Bible tells us, the tenth day of the seventh month. How often is that? Once a year. So can I call that one a yearly Sabbath? It's not the same as the weekly Sabbath. So let's distinguish. We have a weekly Sabbath and we have a yearly Sabbath. How often is the yearly Sabbath? Very good. <laughs> Once a year. There are a lot of yearly Sabbaths in the Old Testament. The Passover. Feast of unleavened bread with the Passover. It was a Sabbath day. 
a lot of yearly Sabbaths. And it came once a year. And look at the end of verse 27. An offering is to be made to the Lord on that day. Every one of those yearly Sabbaths involved a sacrifice or an offering to the Lord. Passover, they offered a lamb as a sacrifice and put his blood on the doorpost. Now follow me. When they offered a lamb as a sacrifice, did that lamb save anybody? No. The lamb didn't save anybody. The lamb pointed forward to the lamb of God who would die on the cross and save us. So follow me. The lamb that was offered as a sacrifice in the Old Testament was a shadow of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He was the reality to come. So the Lamb, the offering, the sacrifice was a shadow pointing forward to Christ. Therefore, the Day of Atonement, the Passover, they were all shadows pointing forward to the reality who is Christ. Every one of those yearly Sabbath days involves sacrifices. And every one of them was a shadow. The weekly Sabbath pointed backward to creation. It wasn't a shadow. It was a reminder written in God's Ten Commandment, moral law, describing what love is, love to God and love to fellow man. And it stands forever. You see, we have two kinds of Sabbaths. Weekly Sabbath, which is not a shadow. The yearly Sabbath, which is a shadow. So when Paul says, let no man judge you by Sabbath days, which are shadows, he's looking at the yearly Sabbaths. And they've been done away with. He's not talking about the weekly Sabbath. No more than I said, when I said I'm going to give you all the grapes which are green, I'm not talking about the red ones. So when Paul said, let no one judge you by Sabbath days which are shadows, he's not talking about the weekly Sabbath, which is not a shadow, because it is an eternal reminder that God is the creator, and we'll be celebrating and rejoicing over that even in heaven. You see, when you understand there are two kinds of laws, then there's no contradiction. When he says the law has been nailed to the cross, it stood against us. Those sacrificial laws were nailed to the cross. We don't have to offer sacrifices anymore. Why? Because the Lamb of God, Christ our Passover, has died. You see, it all fits together. Let me show you something else kind of interesting. If I can do it quickly here, in Deuteronomy, and this illustrates the point, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, remember, he was getting ready to go up on the mountaintop to meet God in the cloud. He said, chisel out two stone tablets and then come up with me up on the mountain and make a wooden chest. And I'm going to write on those tablets the Ten Commandments. So Moses cut out the two tablets out of the stone and he went up on top of the mountain and he handed those tablets up to God and the Bible says God himself wrote with his own finger on those tablets of stone the Ten Commandments. And then he said, Moses said, verse 3, so I made an ark, a wooden chest, and in verse 4, the Lord wrote on those tablets the Ten Commandments and he did what God said he put them inside the chest. The end of verse 2. So God wrote, and let me say it a little differently, God wrote with his own finger on stone the Ten Commandments. And Moses put them inside the Ark of the Covenant. You got the picture? Now watch this. In Deuteronomy Chapter 31, verse 24, after Moses finished writing in the book the words of the law, so after Moses finished writing his book on the words of the law, 
He, verse 25, he gave this command to the Levites, that's the priests, that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. What's inside the Ark? The tablets of stone. So Moses wrote his book, and he gave them this command. He said, verse 26, take the book of the law, the one that Moses wrote, and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and there it will remain as a witness against you. So the Ten Commandments, God wrote on stone with his own finger and put inside the ark, but Moses wrote the law on paper or papyrus or whatever they wrote on back then. Moses wrote it on paper and put it beside the ark of the covenant. One on stone inside, one on paper outside. One written by God, one by Moses. One stood against us. And that's exactly what Paul said in Colossians. The law with its ordinances that stood against us was abolished, taken it away, nailed to the cross. But the one inside the ark, he says in Hebrews chapter 8, is written inside our hearts. Same law that God wrote on stone. It doesn't go away. Paper goes away, not stone. Now he writes on our hearts. See, it all fits together when you recognize there are two different kinds of laws. So if any time you see a writing about Paul doing away with the law, you just have to say, which law? Sacrifices or the moral law? The Ten Commandments. No, not the moral law, never because it describes the character of God. It describes love. God can't change. But those sacrificial laws abolished, torn up, nailed to the cross, and everything fits. One more difficult text, and this is a little easier again. Let's go back to Romans, this time the seventh chapter. In Romans chapter 7, this one is the function of the law. The function of the purpose of the law. Verse 7, what shall we say then? I'm in Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said do not covet. So which law is Paul writing about now? The one that says, do not covet. And which law says, do not covet? The Ten Commandments. All right, so is the law sin? No. I wouldn't have known what sin was, what coveting was, except for the law that said, do not covet. So Paul, the great preacher of righteousness, the most spiritual writer in the New Testament, I believe, still needed the law to tell him what sin was. That's the purpose of the law, is to reveal sin. It's like God's mirror. Now, some of you may have noticed when you drove into the parking lot that we have an RV parked at the end of the parking lot. What you probably didn't know is that it used to be a Greyhound bus. It was a 1975 Greyhound bus, 35 years old. And we had it rebuilt into an RV that we could live in. And have had it like 10 years now. I love that old bus. I don't know, man, it's just something about it. I love my bus. And I'm not a mechanic or anything. Don't misunderstand me. But when I go to that back and I open those two big doors back there, see that big engine? Oh, man, it just does something to me. Love that big engine. And I don't know how to fix stuff, but I know how to check the oil and tinker a little bit back there. And every time I go back here and fool around, and I go back inside the house, Dina goes, Whoa! You can't come in here like that. Why not? You got grease all over you. And sure enough, man, I got it on my hands, all over my face, my arms. I'm a preacher. I don't like grease on my hands. So I get angry. Oh, I am angry. 
So I, I go back into the bathroom and I, oh, it's all over my face too. Now I'm really angry. What am I going to do? So I walk over to the wall and I yank that mirror off the wall and take it outside and smash it on the sidewalk. That'll fix all that grease, huh? Well, the grease is still there. I just can't see it anymore. But it's still there. Sometimes people go to God's law and it says, Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, oh, I don't like that. I know what I'll do. I'll take that law and I'll nail it to the cross. Do away with it. Now I'm under grace now. The sins are still there. I just can't see them anymore. Well, I could do something else. I could look in the mirror and say, grease pop. So I know what I'll do. I'll take that mirror. So I go take the mirror down off the wall and start washing my face off with the mirror. That'll get rid of the grease. Well, it doesn't. It makes it worse. And it ruins the mirror. Can't see anything very good in there anymore. You know, some people do that with God's mirror. They see the commandments and it points out their sins. Thou shalt not lie, steal. Oh, I've never done that. No. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh. I know what I'll do. I'll obey the law. And they try to obey the law so that God can save them. But you see, when you do that, your sins are still there. You just bring the law down to something you can do instead of lifting it up to what only he could do. And it ruins the law. You can't be saved by keeping the law. You see, it's the law of God that keeps me on my knees at the foot of the cross. The object of the Antichrist attack, the law of God and the cross of Christ. And if he could just do away with one, we become lawbreakers. Thank God for the grace of Jesus Christ.